I am unashamed. What about you? All right, so welcome back to Unashamed. We were just laughing about because Zach's not with us today, and he uh, we did a, a podcast with him yesterday, and he was he was very for Zach he was super quiet. And uh, Dad, you said you saw him sleeping. A lot of people, you know, they've learned how to be wide awake, but then they're asleep. <laughs> Their eyes are open, but they're asleep. It is. No, I've I've talked about that's a skill that you develop. Oh yeah. It's funny because I was talking about having a cricket crowd in Colorado. <laughs> and meanwhile, Zach, and I don't think it's because the podcast was boring. He was having trouble staying awake. <laughs> so I think that. Translates. Well, he, he's been working hard. This movie's out. He's, you know, kind of burning both ends of the candle. But I mean, I don't know that he could be working any harder than I'm working because I'm on the road. I'm, I got eight appearances this month, you know, so it's two like, or three times I paused because I thought, well, I don't want to be hogging the conversation. I'll throw it to Zach. And he's just. <laughs> what what was it? You got, what's your I name? Mean, it's the perfect. <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving. Because Zach is like the rest of us. He likes to talk. And, uh, yeah, and you never know how he's going to come in, though. Some days he's like, he's, he's preoccupied, and then we're like, I'm prompting him. I'm, I'd made a strong point in the thing and looked at him like, okay, come in, follow that up, Zach. Crickets. Yeah. So so I called him yesterday after we did the podcast because I was talking about another potential guest coming up in the future. And, uh, it's so funny. I I was just trying to get under his skin a little bit because Zach's one of the few people I can still make fun of because he's not sensitive. Yeah, and so uh, and he expects it. I mean, you know. I look, I I used to be the biggest trash talker, like in all sports and competition, and I learned that after I made a few people cry, uh, especially. Females, you know, when we you were a part of some of that. Oh yeah, playing cards. You, you remember were, the time we were playing cards with Shirley Riley, our neighbor? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, we were young. Like I don't even think you were like a a teenager, and yeah. I was maybe like just got married. We were playing hearts, which look hearts can be a brutal <laughs> game. If you've never played the game hearts, it's very barbaric <laughs> and brutal well it, basically you team up against whoever is winning that's right and it, it's part of the game and if you give a color commentary on that <laughs> i mean we just looked up and our neighbor who was she used to come and play cards with us and so and she's she was like a grown woman married she's our parents kids. our parents age right and then so <laughs> we're playing cards and we're and jason and i are just doing what we do and we look up, and she just bust out balling. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't and figure it out. I felt so bad. I was moment. like. <laughs> but I, that, was, that was the beginning of many times that I got into situations where tears were shed, <laughs> threats were made. Over, I'm, It's not like we're playing for money. I mean, these were <laughs> gin rummy, funsies. hearts, spades. spades you rook. remember one of the elders at, uh, at, the, at WFR. You know, his wife, back in the day, we were playing spades. And same thing. <laughs> and I remember that hand, specific hand, because they needed, like, if they caught their bid, which is crazy, I'm going back 30 years, and I, I remember <laughs> this hand. You remember a hand 30 years ago. Spade, well, <laughs> this is what made her cry, which I've apologized if we made up. <laughs> Which but is good. they, we had to set them to extend the game, and so we, you know, the bids came out, whatever, and uh, and so we sandbagged them is basically the term yeah. for you spades players, right. and so I it was a setup. You know, I I turned my hand over with like six tricks left to catch because I had the rest of them. You knew you had it because I play cards. This is what we do. And she said, well, "What are you doing? Is it is it possible to, that you might have carried card playing a little bit?" <laughs> yeah, we we were probably a little too competitive. No, I, yeah. I was, but I I laid down. I, there was like six cards left, and I had the rest of them. I had the ace of spades. And I had done the math. I'm almost four. seventy, and I've never played a game of cards. <laughs> well, you never look, were a card there's guy. There's four then. suits, Phil. There's hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. Spades or trumps. Well, spades or trumps, and I look at my hand, and I have. 
six spades left in my hand, and they need like five. I mean, they need, you know, I, I need to catch the rest of the tricks for them to go set, and or whatever it was. So they they needed one more to make their bid, and but I have the rest of them, and so because I've counted the amount of spades that have come out and realized that it's a mathematical impossibility yeah. for me not Which to Which is catch. why we were always good because you, when you're good at cards, you count cards and you know what's been, you remember what's been played. So I, so I showed my last six cards, giving the impression that I will start with the ace of spades and lead it, then the king, and somewhere in here, you have been mathematically eliminated for catching your bid, and you are now set. So I said, I got the rest of them. And she said, well, what are you doing? Exposing your hand. I said, I have the rest of the tricks. You're going set. It's like and, the, in dominoes when you play three times in a row. You know, like, yeah. you know you're the she only one. She said, well, play it out. <laughs> That's where I messed up. <laughs> I picked my hand up, and then I didn't play the ace of spades. I slammed the ace of spades and said, okay. I slammed the king of spades. That's when they started crying. And yep. they cried. Tears began to flow, and apologies <laughs> then were given. Now, look, was I wrong? Yes. I'm not <laughs> defending it. That's why maybe I wore this shirt. I could be wrong. It's could actually be wrong. not. This was – so, anyway uh, – to go back to Zach, I, I was trying to get under his skin because he he can he he can take it. Yeah, you know, because he's uh, one of, he's one of us. It was like when I went on a mission trip, first mission trip I ever went on. We went to Romania, and I, at this time I was twenty six years old, so I was still kind of still left over from that our childhood and and early twenties in terms of games. And so you know, it was long flights, long airport, all that. So we're playing hearts. And it's with Kellett and Chris Howard and then Steve Adam, who's also one of our elders now. Well, you know, I mean, like, I just went back into the mode. I'm always in playing cards. Well, Adam, who's got quite the temper, he gets hot, you know, because yeah. you, you just, you know, you're playing with somebody good. He didn't know the game as well as I knew the game. He just gets up and flings his cards and storms off. And I was like, wait, we're on a mission trip. Like, <laughs> <laughs> We got to work together. We we can't be fighting over hearts. So I started to realize then that probably the way I always did it was not going to bode well for me in the future. So for years I never played cards. But some good friends of ours that we travel with, she wanted to play rook. She brought the rook cards, and I was dubious because I thought, I mean, I really like these folks, and I thought, oh, I'm gonna have to <laughs> like not care what happens, which is hard because your instinct is to go for the juggler. That's you know that's the way we did it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, we were raised in an environment where you you had to be thick skinned. Uh, it's just a, part of it. The there's a movie of- out there about it. You'll see the conditions we were in. <laughs> One of the things we did to escape the current situation uh, and lack of money was we played cards yeah, and, that's and, right. and dominoes. Bill's parents were notorious trash talkers. And, oh, they were. They liked. They liked it. This was fun. Yeah, we learned it from your parents. Yeah, that's that, the that's way I was came. raised. You and your brothers. You don't just win. You tell them about <laughs> your victory. Now, look, the next day, you're on the other side of it. Yeah. You're eating crow. You got to take it. You, you can give it, but you got to take it, too. You can't get mad about so it. So I tried to defend it in the first early years of my faith of making people upset. And I'm like, they need to toughen up. And But after a while, I realized... What would Jesus do? No, I can't be slamming cards right. <laughs> and trash and talking. Making people cry. No, I cannot it's do taking it. taking a little too seriously. Yeah. Well, but we're not, I wasn't really serious. This was, it was part of the game for us. You, it's you, like you when you, I mean? It's like when you watch professional sports now, and the whole time they're on the field or on the court, they're just jawing at each other. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's – and we're not hearing what they're saying, but yeah. it, it probably is not very, you know, kind. And so – but that's just what they expect. It's just trash talking. Well, look, it's fun. I play cards now with people who can who can dish it out and take – and I enjoy it. But it, if there's anybody new there or right. I'm never going to do that. And I'm not near like I used to be because I think it's just frivolous. Right. You know. Well, I'm like that, though, with just even joking around. Like, so the other night we were at an event for the movie, 
and Jersey Joe went with us, and Joe's just like he's like my brother in law. He's like Tony. They're they're thick skinned. You can kid with them; they don't get offended. Right. And I love that. So I'm going to be way more over the top and and kidding around and joking with them. But if it's somebody I don't know, I'm not going to take a chance of offending them, you know, because I don't know how thin skinned they are. So it's just kind of knowing your audience. Yeah, I think more than anything, but. Well, right. But now, uh, look, I mean, you can make a case uh, Jesus was very offensive to a lot of people, but he did it the right way. It was <laughs> He was giving truth, not trash talk. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, But I do think you can't take yourself too seriously. I mean, there's a balance in there. Yeah. And people shouldn't act like an idiot because they want a card game. Right. You know, it's, you know, rubbing it in can hurt people's feelings. And you don't know what kind of triggers that are out there for people but you know we had when we had philip on the podcast you remember he talked about it about it got so bad (laughs) he's one of the ones i offended early on as new christians we would get them together and play cards because look you got to remember we had we there were hundreds literally hundreds in that age group that came to the lord during that time and they're like what are we gonna do so our house and jace's house were like meccas of Card games and because it was mainly just staying away from worldly people was the main thing. Like, but we were still kind of just doing what we always did. So even though I tried to work on my attitude when I played cards and all, because I, I love these guys, I'm trying. We're trying to get yeah. them to heaven. Uh, Philip was one of the ones that after a card game, you know, he's like, "Can I talk to you?" You know, and he's like, "I'm really offended by that." You know, <laughs> I mean, you're you're like you're rubbing it in, and I, and it was like. Man, you should have seen me five years ago. <laughs> you think that was offensive? <laughs> and so Philip told the story on the podcast, if y'all remember, that it, it got down to the last thing, and he he just he knew what was coming, so he just said, "Excuse me, I got to go to the bathroom," and he went out a window and just left. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> rather than take what he was going to get, that's taking card playing a little too far. <laughs> well, it wasn't just cards, Phil. We had a famous story that uh. I don't know if I've ever told before, but we used to play fast pitch softball. I played for years, and uh, we had the best pitcher around here. And the, our pitcher was the guy who lives in the Dallas area now. He's the guy that came to the Lord that by accident. Yeah, we he was studying the, with somebody else. And, yeah. yeah, he overheard the uh, conversation. Well, he, this guy. While everybody was in high school doing whatever they were do, doing, he was practicing pitching a softball underhanded. I mean, he was a stud. He could smoke it. And so we were just we were just beating everybody, winning the league. Well, after a while, you know, it just kind of like there, there was no competition. And so what we decided to do, because we had a pool of players that played on the team, because it's hard to get everybody for the whole season. I mean, people working. I mean, this is like played a couple of years. You did, and so what we decided to do one year was split our team into two teams, and everybody kind of recruited some other guy and play each other. Oh man, (laughs) that sounds like a great idea. (laughs) We're all brothers, right? The trash talking between the two teams, the two church teams. Because we're winning every every game, they're winning every game. And I'm not on uh, McIntosh's team. You know, they had the best pitcher because they had him, and he had taught me how to pitch. This was kind of late in our careers. And so, uh, obviously, we were at a disadvantage because I'm not as good a pitcher as McIntosh. But I was I was learning quickly. Yeah. So I got in the game, and uh, I was the leadoff hitter. Well, uh, McIntosh, first pitch he threw to me, I deposited it over the fence, home run, and talked all the way around the bases. I should have known right there this was not going to end well. Because <laughs> it embarrassed him. Because he was like, all day, he was like, I'm going to strike you out, you know. And Well, one of his buddies, our mutual friends who played on his team, he was telling me, I'm going to take you deep, you know. This is before the game. They called me. I was at Duck Command. They called me and like laughing. So first pitch of the game, I took it deep. We're up. One nothing. So then when I'm facing them, the guy who said he was going to take me deep and was the best home run hitter yeah. you know, around, I, I loaded the bases on walks because I, I was a good pitcher, but I was wild. And 
I just thought it was a, it got to a three, two count and I was throwing my off speed and he kept fouling it off, kept fouling it off, kept fouling it off. Cause I was struggling with fastball. And I thought, you know what? Who cares if I walk? I mean, he's, I'm not going to give in. And I just thought I'm fixed to rear back and throw this as hard as I can. So I threw a fastball after about three changeups and I blew it by him. He swung late, you know? Well, in that moment, I just lost it. <laughs> and I hollered. As loud as I could. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> so I struck him out and then I showed him up because I said, Sit down. Well, when I said, Sit down, of course, this guy's about He's a big way guy. bigger than me. He's a big guy. He turned and started walking right toward me, like, because I'm on the mound. Yeah. And like an idiot, I'm like, What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Benches cleared. <laughs> Willie, who was on our team, he come running by me from the outfield like, oh, we just lost it, you know. And so before any punches were thrown, somebody said, this is a fine way for Christian to be. <laughs> yeah, it's so, it a little too far. So then we wound up having a prayer. This is during the game. And the umpire said, you are pathetic. <laughs> 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 oh, I've forgotten about that. Jason. So That's, I, I was there that night. But too. then I tell you, when I lost my competitive spirit, then we lost like twelve to two. <laughs> but I did have two home runs. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and you did it. tell him to sit down. Let's take a break. One thing you know about um, just living life is you're going to have some things happen to you over the course of your life. You have a family. You have children. Uh, you have more opportunities to have some medical emergencies. And you get that unexpected medical bill, what do you do? Well, one of our new sponsors uh, is a group called Samaritan Ministries, and they have a biblical solution, which I love. Lisa and I have joined up ourselves, uh, so we're excited about that. It's a community of Christians that pay each other's medical bills. It's not insurance, it's assurance, which is a biblical concept, um, where you have a sharing community not only just for the financial stuff where the medical need arises, but also spiritually. Um, you can join anytime. Your medical bills are sent to Samaritan Ministries. They notify fellow members to pray for you. And so I get prayer requests already, uh, which is great. And also to send money directly to you for your shareable bills. Your medical bills get paid. You'll find comfort in the prayers and encouragement. Uh, so it's not just a faceless company, but it is a ministry. Another thing I love about it, is that uh, when this medical emergency comes up, you don't have to worry about which hospital or ER doctor that you go to, uh, whether they're in network. They have no network restrictions. You have total freedom to choose whatever doctor, hospital, or treatment is best for you and your family. It's a biblical solution to healthcare, Samaritan Ministries, when we bear one another's burdens. And they're focused on ministry and not profit. So join 80,000 Christian households across the nation sharing 30 million in medical needs every month. Become part of this community today at SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. That's SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. Join up today. Oh man, that was memory lane there. I'd forgotten yeah. about all that. I do remember dad playing though, and uh, dad pitched some. Because he always had a good arm, but we put dad in center field because he could throw the ball. I mean, somebody hits the ball out there, dad could throw the ball to home plate on a on a rope. Yeah, I saw line. some he strange threw, things from Phil's arm. You had that NFL talent arm. You so. threw one one day, dad. You were way out. I mean, you were like at the fence, and these are big parks. You threw the ball, and I think you were throwing it to third, and it started rising, and it went into the other park at the other. <laughs> <laughs> where they were playing. I, actually, I mean, I don't know wow. how far that was. I actually remember that. Remember Everybody that? was like, Everybody what just, did what he just, just happened? That was like a shot out of a cannon. It was. It just rose out of sight into another field of play. It was so funny. Well, we went down a rabbit hole, but we lost Zach. Uh, yeah, we he, said all that. We started with Zach. He's not here today, so I hope he's sleeping. and He needs some rest. some rest. But we're in Luke chapter 15, and we're going to hang out here. A while just because to be honest this is just so good yeah so we introduced it last podcast is there and it's about the midpoint of the whole gospel 
and but it kind of wraps up everything he's been talking about in the last two or three chapters to me. I mean, you know, you can make a case that they all go together, but he's kind of wrapping up this thing. He's been talking about all these uh, settings where they were eating and they had all these controversies back and forth. And so, yeah, given the picture of I'm bringing a kingdom and there's going to be a great feast and the eternal consequences of that. And we actually left off in overtime with a with a passage that. I jump forward to in Luke 17 and verse 20 and 21 when it says, once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come visibly, or some versions say with careful observation, nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is within you. Or some versions say among people. Yeah. But the reason I brought that up is because you got to remember Jesus came saying, "Repent, for the kingdom is near." He's acting as the King. Yeah. The Son of God. He has supernatural ability. He's going to be the King. And they're all like, "Well, when, 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 when is it?" And he started talking about where, and he said, "It's in you." And so when you tie that in with what's happening in Luke 15, the accusation from the Pharisees and teachers we talked about, they were muttering about Jesus. They said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them because Jesus was having a meal with tax collectors and sinners. So he tells them three stories three parables, all about something being lost and found. A sheep, a coin, and a son. And so the result of it being found in each case caused joy not only on earth, but in heaven. And we talked about this last podcast. He zeroed in on this power and godly fundamental of the power of one person being valuable enough for Jesus to come and save and rescue that. And so that's why I brought that up. The kingdom is within you. It's within people. This is a, it, it's almost a uh, explanation of the narrow gate in that it's Jesus, but it happens one at a time. You know, it's funny, Jace, because you, you said this many times before that movies are made with so many spiritual themes and I'm not even sure the writers of them know that they're coming from that. It's just that it's almost like they've heard this. So I was watching the other night, and I thought about this text and, and what we're talking about. I was watching one of the Marvel movies that it's a, it's a Thor, which is the whatever he is. And is it's that my, the guy with the hammer. Yeah, the hammer. Yeah. So it was my it's my favorite of all those movies. I don't know why. I just this one really resonated. But I liked it, but I didn't really look at it like it came out of this until. So this the the setup is they're on this this uh, uh, Asgard, which is their planet, you know, where they all come from, and so it gets destroyed, and the people escape before it gets destroyed. And he says first, his dad tells him this. His dad's like a whatever. His dad tells him that. Asgard is not a place, it's the people. And so then the people get on a ship and they escape. And when the planet's destroyed, he says that to the people. He says, Asgard is not a place, it's a people. And th- so the kingdom survived even the planet getting destroyed. And I thought that they got that from this. This is the idea that the kingdom is not a place. It's not a boundaries around a certain piece of property. It really is people, which I thought was really interesting. Which is interesting you bring that up, because when we get to the next chapter in Luke 16, that's what that's all about, about when when we get to heaven and begin eternal life, all the things that we chase on earth, and just put anything there. I mean, at the top of the list, from Jesus's perspective, is money. There's more. He brings up money more than anything else. It, it's not gonna. It's not needed. There's nothing you can do right. with money in the afterlife, and you know you get this incredible depiction of the rich man and Lazarus. When it's all said and done, you got a beggar and you got one of the richest men on the planet, and they are in opposite places. Yeah. And the rich man, what can he do now? 
It really and the thrust of the there's been a lot. We'll get into that. We get there, but there's been a lot of that. Is that are those real people? Is this just a story? Is what? But the don't miss the point. Jesus is trying to make. There's regret if all you had was this life, and that was the whole point of that parable, which we'll get to when we get yeah, there. Yeah, and even the the first story before you get to that one, the parable of the shrewd manager, is very. Uh, it's I don't think I've ever heard a sermon preached on it, but it's basically about being ready for the next phase. That's right. Now, he used an earthly story about, you know, a guy's going to lose his job, whatever, but then he he was shrewd to, even though he was going to lose his job, he was going to use whatever he could, resources, for a new beginning. Well, Jesus then applies that to the eternal hope that we have. Well, it's about Whatever a group. money you have, use it. Yeah. 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 For- it's about a group who go forth as one, which is difficult to do to get everybody on board with the same thinking yeah. process. Yeah, the unity of it. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. And that's the power of it. Yes, right. It, you, you can't break it up because you peel off a little bit. There's, some, there's, a, there's others that replace it. it it's, it's a group and individually – they have the, group same, of individuals. have the same goal. <laughs> yeah. That's it. And you're right. The problem is, and we, we outlined this a little bit in the last You podcast. don't see, see those actively working. No. The problem is once you become part of the 99, to use the illustration he did in the sheep, yep. it's hard for you not to think like a collective that's right. where you quit caring about the one. <laughs> That's right. So that you're right. You you've zeroed in on it. The idea is to be unified. I but mean, in a everyone, contrary to all of these years before, you see what happens when you get a little bitty small group calling the shots. That's right. And and and, and the bulk of them are weeded out. Get out of the way. You're not a. You're not worth getting up here and doing this and doing that. Well, if you finally get to get a a group of individuals who are they think as one and act as one, and they they're guided by love for the head. Yeah, and it, it it's just a it's a unique way of operating. Well, I found well, that we, we know what it works because we're here. <laughs> if groups, if collectives, can always be concerned about the one, then they'll stay on track. If it stays cord in in this and grace, you do well. But when you get away from that, is when you run into the same problems that are happening in this. See, that's why they're 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 asking Jesus, "What about that one? Oh, what about this one? What about this one? What about that one?" They're looking for ways to rule over them. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean that that's just the nature of mankind. <laughs> that's right, and it, and you're right. It's it's the ultimate in human nature. Let's yep. t- let's take another break. Jace, one of the fun things about um, kind of going through this process with TV shows and now podcasts, and we get to meet people along the way. And I get you get to meet sometimes people you really like loved, you know, when you were a kid and you were growing up. And one of those guys for me is Chuck Norris. Oh, wow. You know, even his mustache could beat people up. It's what I thought when I was a kid. You know, he just he had a look about him. You know, he was in all those movies, he knew karate, you know, he was just, he was my guy. And I got to meet him a few years ago. He's 75 years old. And, I mean, when I shook his hand, I thought, this guy could whip me in about two seconds. <laughs> he's 75. <laughs> At the time, I was like, you know, 50. But he's an amazing guy. Uh, he's, of course, an action star. He's also a veteran. He's a family man. He kept telling me about his aquifer and water and all these cool things. He says he feels better at now 83 than he has in years. And he made one change uh, to his diet. What he realized is after decades of trying every supplement out there, most of them did nothing for his health, but a few did provide dramatic changes. So he put them all together in a drink that he calls morning kick. And Lisa's been taking this. She hadn't kicked me yet, but I'm expecting it any day. Uh, morning kick combines all of all 10 of Chuck Norris's favorite supplements into one daily drink. It's got probiotics, prebiotics, superfoods, and several of the most powerful supplements on earth. It tastes great, just like strawberry lemonade, uh, and I'm about to start trying it myself so Lisa and I can fight it out. If you want to try it yourself, head over to Chuck's website at mymorningkick.com slash unashamed. That's mymorningkick.com slash unashamed. So remember, 
all individuals are unique and as such, your results can and will vary. It's amazing to me, though, even how many scholars are kind of taken up for the older brother when we get to him and taken up for the 99 who doesn't need to repent. But yep. you got to remember the, the Pharisees, this is not a warm and fuzzy. I mean, they're, they're attacking him. Oh, big time. Uh, even in the next chapter, in chapter 16, this withering uh, story about what you do with your money, you know, he gets to verse... 14 and it said of 16 it says the pharisees who loved money well he he pretty much has zeroed out i mean a zeroed in on you can't love money and god that's not going to work at that's the right. same degree you either love money or you love god there's no uh yep. in, in between there so uh and the murmuring went to sneering by the way when it came to talking about money. And you gotta remember at this stage of of the life of Jesus Christ, at this stage, this is just before he is going to die a horrible death here shortly. But you wouldn't think he's talking like this with each group and how you should treat each other. He goes out of his way. He's fixed to die. Right. But it, his death provides salvation for a large number who who will accept it by faith, right? These right. people are, don't have faith. That's right. They, they, it's a it's a battle, and they're looking at him. Oh they're, yeah, they're physically looking at yeah, the Messiah. They, they would be shocked if they understood what was fixing to happen. Well, he's been been telling them, but but they're not buying. That's it. why well, Jesus even told the group there. Remember, he said. Blessed are you because you you're seeing me and that's you get right. it. But but blessed even more are the ones after who won't even see me. That's right. But will understand me. That's yeah. why it's interesting in like chapter fourteen and verse one. It's like when he was at the prominent Pharisee house, they were watching him, but they weren't watching him. Yeah, that's a great point. Like you want to watch Jesus, they're just trying to remember. We said that word, Jay's that Greek word meant ambush. It's lying in wait. It's you know you think if you're watching for somebody in a positive way, you know you're excited, you're looking forward to. It. But if you're if you're looking to waylay and ambush somebody, that's watching all the wrong way. So I did some research. You have to go back all the way back to Luke chapter nine. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell anyone. He said the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests. Teachers of the law, he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. He's fixing to tell you how to live your life after he does this. Well, you know, Al, they they're scratching their head, saying he just said he's fixing to die. Yeah, the message was too. Uh, and too this drastic. is how you ought to behave. You ought to, so you that's just that's that's Luke nine. Right, but he just spells it out. But he's been doing it right. up to that. I'm going to die, so here's the way. You, here's the way you need to roll. Yeah, but it's one thing, Dad, to think, okay, you're going to die, but the death of a system, the one I've always known. Now that's that. Now we're getting personal. Yeah, these guys, which is why they had such a hard time. What were you going to say, Jess? You did research. Well, I, was, I was going to say I did research, and uh, because some people defend the older brother, and I'm just not seeing it. I I, I really think that you had the scenario, tax collectors and sinners, and Jesus is eating with them, and the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttering. So you have two groups of people and Jesus in the middle. Yep. And I really believe that this lost son represents the first group of people, which is the tax collectors and sinners, and yep. I believe the older son represents... The second group of people, it's no which doubt is the true. Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Yep, yep. But I've just, I was, I was amazed that there were there were a few people that I read who I generally respect that they didn't see it that way, and I, yep. I don't. They were defending the older brother, and I thought, I don't think so. I couldn't defend that guy. No, because to me. When we get to that, which I know we're not specifically there, I'm jumping ahead, but I'm just trying to set the context of the first two verses, is that they both 
wanted their father's stuff. Now, granted, the younger son, he basically gave the equivalent to, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance. I'm out of here. I mean, he left. He wanted the stuff, which happens, you know, when your father dies. I mean, what? Kind, that's horrible. Yeah. No, no, I'm not making light of that. But this older brother, well, he doesn't like his brother coming back. He doesn't like him wasting, the father wasting, his, in his mind, his money. And I'm like, they're both using the father for his stuff and his money rather than appreciating the father. And I think the what I notice is that the father went to both of them. Yep. He ran to the younger son, and he ran to the older son and gave the same message. That's I'm right. trying to give you every, you ha- you already have everything I have. Right. No, I agree. So I don't know. Do you agree with that? I agree 100%. In okay. fact, I, I was, we're not quite there, but I want to read this now anyway since you brought it up. This was so good. I just had to bring it and read it. This is out of Chuck Swindoll's book. He says, The parable of the prodigal son is perhaps the best known yet least understood story Jesus ever told. It resonates deeply with readers because they so readily see their own experiences reflected in the wayward son's choices. And he's right. And they long for the kind of grace shown to him by the father. Furthermore, we all know that wayward people who have caused intense heartache. So this powerful story of forgiveness challenges us to imitate the gentle, merciful father who's the hero of the story. Yet lurking in the shadows is a figure we all know, a frowning, finger-wagging, petulant enemy of grace who never fails to spoil a good story of reconciliation. No, I agree. Who does this older brother represent? The answer is obvious and surprising at the same time. So I thought it was just really well spoken to to your point, Jace, because he agrees with us that yeah. really that, that he's the villain of the story. You know, well, I've noticed something about Pharisees. They can't recognize other Pharisees. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so I'm saying uh, people right. who are defending the older brother, I, I was really shocked about that. That's why I brought it up. I didn't yeah. notice that till, yeah, till I studied this last night, but I thought, no, I agree. Really? That's uh, let's, let's take another break. So I think it's impressive that Jesus off the top of his head, uh, you know, tells these three parables. And we talked a little bit about the sheep and how, I mean, look, we were talking about being thick skin and thin skin. I mean, the creator of the universe now in human form compares us humans to one of the dumbest animals on the planet. Yep. I don't think that's by accident. That's right. So and most helpless. I mean, pretty well, they much ha- they need a shepherd. Yeah, they don't have any defense of themselves. And there's no loyalty. You know, they'll they'll just they'll just wander off. Right. And they're lost, and they'll fall off cliffs chasing grass. And it's really kind of an app when you really think about it. What what causes all the problem problems with a sheep? And if you do some research, you'll see this. It, it's all based on their appetite. It's, they have one thing on their mind, eating grass, and nothing else matters. They don't even realize the danger they put themselves in. And so I noticed that in all, in all that research, research, the number one death of sheep besides, you know, someone trying to eat one is uh, they just fall off cliffs yeah. and just die. <laughs> <laughs> they don't realize where they're at right. and they'll just, they'll just fall and die. Which, you know, you read the 23rd Psalm, David, who was a shepherd, kind of lays out that, the nature of sheep, even looking at his own life, which is interesting. So the the principles that we took out of that first story, and then we're about to read the second one about the treasure, uh, the principles are that the father is a seeker because he goes to get the one. So the idea is he, he goes to look, and, of course, then he compares that to the 99. And also, Jay's the point we brought up last time, and we're going to see this in the next story, is the joy and the rejoicing that happens when a lost sheep is found. And so he puts it in the story. But then he says when a, when a sinner comes to grace and comes to repentance, the angels in heaven rejoice. 
I mean, like like a football game in another realm. I mean, that's a big deal. And I was thinking about that with the people that have seen the movie and come to, to Grace. I just thought, man, the last few weeks, heaven has been loud. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, just from people we know that have come to Christ, which well, is pretty powerful. Yeah, I wanted to say one thing, too. And I noticed that I've shared this before, but not in this context, that he, in Matthew's version of this, this story comes in a completely different place. In Matthew 18, there's no doubt that he's talking about kids in, in verse 1. I've never heard anybody teach this, and, and every uh, commentary I read, just to see, you know, every once in a while you have an idea when you read something, you think, ooh, has anybody discovered this? <laughs> to my surprise, I read, I have zero support in the people I read, but I just want to throw it out there. And I do have my shirt on that says I could be wrong. But he's talking about who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So he calls a child and had him stand among them and said, I tell you the truth, you know, unless you became like, become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And we went through that. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom, which goes along with the previous chapter in Luke. When it, remember when he said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Then he goes with the consequences of children, of people who cause children to stumble. It would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around his neck and... uh so it's like the reason this other movie has received so much fanfare. What was the name? Sound of Freedom. Sound of Freedom is That's verses right. like this. Yeah, and I've heard uh, this. I've heard this passage quoted more in the last couple of years because of our current cultural stuff that's going on than I've ever heard in my life. I mean, outside of church, just everywhere. Yeah. And I realize there are all kinds of religious views on this. Some people believe. Uh, you know, children are born into sin, and I do not agree with that. So we just, I don't agree with that. I, I think they're safe. They're right. innocent. They're, I see a baby. I'm like, there's no sin there. Now, do we all have the sinful nature, which is what causes all this debate? And among it's in the curse, right? Theologians and all. But there's no, to me, they're safe. So when you say, are they, you know, you have safe, lost, saved. I mean, that's that's my view. So then he gets to seven. He's still talking about kids. Uh, and then he has this very graphic picture about if your hand or foot causes you to sin, you know, throw it away. It's better to enter life maimed or crippled than have two hands. So, you know, and be thrown into eternal fire. So then he goes down to verse 10. He says, see that you do not look down on one of these little ones. We're we're still talking about this. Mm -hmm. For I tell you that their angels always see the face of my Father in heaven, and that's where people get the idea about guardian angels. And we're not getting into that now, but that means something. But that does kind of support what I was saying about safe. You know, we as lost people who are found, we have Jesus representing us in heaven today. Well, to me, if you had kids who were safe, it would make sense to have angels representing them in heaven yeah. because of their innocence. But right. that's, I'm on an island with that thought. But I, I mean, I do think it's interesting. Yep. So we said all that to say this. So look at what, how Matthew does. So then he says, based on what Jesus said in this context, mm-hmm. what do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep? And one of them wanders away. Will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I'll tell you the truth. He is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones be lost. So that, But the difference is, when he said it this time... There's no repentance. There's no, it's just a wandered off, which would seem like he's talking about kids in this context. Mm -hmm. And then in Luke 15, it seems like he's talking about 
tax collectors and sinners wandering off, same parable with two different people in mind. Now look, you're not going to offend me. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I've never really thought about it maybe being the context um, of the same story, although it very well could be, or he could just be using that same story multiple times because he's teaching another context. But you're right. The wording is the same. Either, whether he's making the point separately from the way he does in the Luke passage or Matthew just takes that story and plugs it in here, either way, I think you're exactly right. Well, the only thing he changes is the repentance. Yeah. It goes from wandering off to they didn't wander off. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, it, it is. Well, what, what, when, you were, when you were talking about this, let's take our last one. When you were talking about this, I looked at the next context of Matthew, and it's the brother who sins against you, and then, G, and then Peter's question about forgiveness, which is kind of interesting, applying that into the story of the two brothers, where the brother couldn't forgive his brother, or wouldn't, so yeah. in a sense, it's almost like Matthew has does have that same theme. He just doesn't tell the story. But he also makes you think that what if a, sin, a kid is sinned against? Let's face it. Some kids are sinned against. They were totally innocent, was 0% their fault, and they're going to have a harder time yep. having clarity to find the Lord because some, somebody else is sinned. Oh, man. Yep. Has caused them trauma. And every and every time Lisa and I speak, she talks about that. She was she was sexually abused as a child. It was not her fault. It was someone else that did it to her. But then she dealt with dishonesty and all these things in her life because of what happened. He said, "Well, you're just taking the blame, putting it on somebody else." No, you're just explaining the root cause of what happens when a child is yeah. sinned against. Then they have to deal with the consequences until they can figure it out. And for her, she didn't figure it out until she was 33 years old. So here's the hope, though, Al, is what I'm trying to say. And look, you can disagree with me. It's fine. I just want you to think about it. Because where the hope is, is that no matter if you were a kid and something terrible happened to you, or if you chose, where you know, in Luke's version, if you made some bad decisions, and that's why you wandered off or what lost from yeah. the herd, the shepherd's coming after you. Yeah, well, he is coming after you to restore you and make right. you whole, and you can start over whether whether you started off right and chose to go wrong, which we all do, yeah. or you were innocent. And somebody else came in there and gave you a lot of baggage that you're going to have to deal with. Jesus is still in pursuit of yes. that person. And to make it right, even though it wasn't your fault the way it started. No, that's a great point. And I'm sure there's people listening that have probably carried along some baggage. And here's the way Lisa describes it. She said, I went out. I fell out in the backyard when she just got to this place. It was so heavy. And she called out to God and said, if you're there, because I'm not sure right now, I'm, I'm such a place. If you're there, come and rescue me. I mean, she made a call to the shepherd. And she said, and he did. I felt it in that moment and knew he had come for me. And so that she was 33. Now she's you know 57. There's been a lot of years that have gone by. But look. She's been released from all that stuff. The shepherd showed her the way out. So she's been released. So if some of you out there, if you're, you're struggling with something that was done to you, something from your past, something from your youth, you have to get to that place where you help let Christ release you from whatever it is. And that's what you're he does. You're talking about the blind now. That's exactly right. That's another good example from the movie. But well, there's plenty of verses talking about justice is coming in the end. It, it, everything will be made right, and as painful and terrible as things that happen, especially to kids. It's not like God's not saying he's not aware of this. He's not asleep. He's, yeah. he, you know, it's, they're like, well, why, why doesn't God care? He cares. Yes. And he, this was his plan and he came down to make wrong things right. And they will be righted. That's right. 
And and that's part of the problem with the older brother, is he wanted justice in the moment, which we'll talk about when we get to him. Let me read this, because we only have a few minutes left on the podcast, and I want to be able to talk about some in overtime, and next time is because we still haven't gotten to the sun. Jace did warn you, we're going to camp out here a while, because there's so much well, good stuff. Yeah, and I mean, there's so many interchanges among other passages, I That's felt right. like we need to bring No, I'm up. so glad you brought the Matthew passage. I hadn't thought about that. So so now in Luke 15, at verse 8, let me read the second little short story, because he's going to give you another context, but he's still making the same point from the first one. He says, or, verse 8, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins, and drachmas is the actual coin they're talking about, uh, and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? So here's, again, he's establishing the principle of the seeker, the the creator, the beginner, the owner, however you want to put it in the context, the shepherd, they're they're, they're seekers because he says she's going to look for it, right? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. There's the second principle from the first story. There's joy. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Yeah. Well, I want to say this. So I'm a treasure hunter. And one of the reasons I got into treasure hunting is this this paragraph. Yeah. Because I thought if the creator of the universe is using this as an illustration of the joy that happens when you find a lost coin— and he's equating that to the reason he's having a meal with tax collectors and sinners and to save humanity, that seems like a good hobby. <laughs> so, it's certainly not a bad hobby. No. <laughs> and, you but, have a scriptural basis for why you do it. But you I'm going to give you a different perspective in this, and I'll talk further in the overtime about it. Is Do you realize that a lot of the coins that we find pre-1900 and i found them all the way back to the 1600s that's the oldest coin i found that they'll have a hole at the top or the bottom because what they used to do in the 16 17 1800s and way before is they would make necklaces out of them or they would represent something you know we, we don't wear coins anymore but that's a new trend the people have been wearing coins, and in their culture, I read a lot of the women who would get married, instead of giving them a ring, they would have this tin coin on a necklace, and it, it was their the equivalent to their wedding ring. So they'd drill the little hole in it, and it's you wouldn't really appreciate it unless you found a lot of coins with holes in it at the top used as a necklace, which I have found many. So it's so the depth of then probably from his perspective of telling the story, it's it's even more meaningful than us thinking about somebody having a handful of quarters. That's right. If you lost your wedding ring, you know, now I lost mine. And look, I went through. Well, I'm still going through the misery (laughs) with my wife of losing that wedding ring because you can't replace it. Right. It's like, how do you lose it? But if I ever find it, imagine the joy. (laughs) You will call you will call your friends and neighbors and have a celebration. I'll keep looking. Well, it's another reason I got into it's, treasure hunting. Gotta keep searching. Maybe I can find that wedding ring one day. All right, we're out of time. So if you want to follow us over to overtime, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the treasure hunting aspect before we get into the to the two sons. So it's uh, blazetv.com slash unashamed is where our overtime segments are. So we'll see you there. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.